Okay, hi everybody. Welcome. Thanks for coming tonight. Um, I will say Zoom, it's such a strange experience. I'm like having a few private chats over here already, you know, before the show's even started. So uh, I think it's going to be a really um, great night. We're super lucky, super excited to have Marcos Key here with us for Insights. Uh, my name is Emmett Byrne, and I'm the design director and associate curator of design here at the Walker Art Center in Minneapolis. Um, I just need to make a few uh, announcements, and then I'll introduce the speakers. First off, I uh, just wanted to say um, thank you to our AIGA Minnesota partners. The Insights Design Lecture Series has been in existence for over 35 years now, and AIGA Minnesota has been an amazing partner to the Walker for all that time. And I really want to thank Brent Stickles and Matt Lowe, especially this year, um, for their partnership and for the AIGA's enduring partnership. AIGA Minnesota works really hard to celebrate great design here in the Twin Cities. So please check out AIGAMinnesota.org to see everything that they've got going on. Uh, I'd also like to quickly thank Shapko Printing, who donated the printing of the poster for this year's series. Um, Shapko has been a really great partner to the Walker for many years. And finally, I'd like to thank Vance Wellenstein and Eric Timothy Carlson for the design of this year's amazing poster, some of which you're seeing right here. Um, make sure to stick around after the talk because Weil and John will be leading a Q&A. And I think we have a nice sort of intimate group today. So I think that lends itself to actually a better conversation. So you'll hear more about that from them in terms of the format. All right, now for tonight's speakers. Morcos Key brings together two incredible perspectives, designers Jonathan Key and Wael Morcos, and represents a model for how a contemporary design studio can create vital work in a number of fields and in the process give visibility to underrepresented communities. The studio works with a variety of arts and cultural institutions, nonprofits and companies in both North America and the Middle East, providing services as varied as brand strategy, Latin and Arabic type design, book design, wayfinding, among many more. Jonathan Key is originally from Seal, Alabama and received his BFA from RISD. Before co-founding Marcos Key, he worked with clients such as HBO, Nickelodeon, the Public Theater, and the Whitney Museum, and has also taught design at a variety of schools, including NICA, Parsons, CCA, and Cooper Union, where he currently teaches. He is also the co-founder and design director of Codify Art, a multidisciplinary collective dedicated to supporting artists of color, particularly women, queer, and trans artists of color. And in 2020, he was featured on the Forbes 30 Under 30 Art and Style list, which sounds very fancy. Very impressive. <laughs> uh, Yael Marcos is originally from Beirut and received his BA in graphic design from Notre Dame University, Lebanon, and his MFA from RISD. Prior to co-founding Marcos Key, while as a senior designer for IBM, a freelance senior designer for Apple, and held a, very, a variety of positions at studios such as Base Design, CNG Partners, and 2x4. He was named one of Print Magazine's 15 Under 30, as well as a Young Gun by the Art Directors Club, and an Ascender by the Type Directors Club. In 2021, Morcos Key received the Black Design Visionaries Impact Grant, which is awarded by the Brooklyn Museum and Instagram to design businesses that offer experimental expressions of Black culture and have a powerful vision for the future. We are very lucky to have them speaking with us tonight. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Wael Morcos and Jonathan Key. Thank you so much, Emmett, for having us. And thank you so much to Walker and to the AIGA Minnesota and everyone here who's been supporting this lecture. We're so excited to be here today to share our work and our talk called Morcos Key as a Practice. So just a little bit of background on who we are and where we're from. I am again, John, I'm John, I'm the key in Morcos Key. Um, I'm originally from Alabama and in Alabama, I used to play instruments. I used to play piano and saxophone. My mom would set up an arts and craft table for my twin and I. I did theater camp. I did all of these different expressions of art. And I learned at an early age that I love performing. I love visual art. I love drawing and that all of these different methods and mediums could really, you know, inspire me and inspire other people. Um, and so, yeah, that's where I started before I went to RISD. 
Hello, everybody. My name is Wael Morcos. I'm the Morcos in Morcos Key, and I'm originally from Beirut, Lebanon. That's where I grew up, and uh, I started my career in graphic design. Lebanon is a tiny country, which gives us an outlook to the outside world, and we're always kind of trying to grow up in a multicultural cosmopolitan world, which has always influenced my, my uh, view of the world. Um, at some point, after working in Beirut for a few years, I came to Providence, to RISD, to get my master's in graphic design, and that's where I met John. Yeah, and I mean, at RISD, again, taking all of these kind of childhood lessons and passions for art and translating that into graphic design for undergrad, there at RISD, I really start to question, what does it mean to be a graphic designer? How does my Blackness show up in my work? How does my queerness show up in my work? How does my family show up in my work? And so all of these questions, I think, really kind of set me and set us again along this path of doing graphic design and really trying to figure out how do you share other stories through this medium. Which brought us to New York City. And like Emma said, we worked for a few places. My first gig out of school was at Spotco doing, um, being an intern, doing theater posters design for Broadway shows and then moving on to great advertising and working um, on amazing things like Red Lobster, <laughs> uh, but then kind of working on the Whitney Museum, which was kind of my last project there. And really um, affirmed for me that I wanted to work in the arts and cultural space. I really loved working with artists. I really loved working with museum institutions. And you know that was one of the things that we wanted to bring into our studio. I had a similar trajectory. I also had a couple of full-time jobs and then several freelance jobs with many offices. And I think that was to me also an illuminating experience to be able to witness different, really uh, inspiring people run their businesses and uh, think of similar problems in entirely different ways. Kind of encouraged me and John to start thinking about what would it mean for us to take our collaboration into uh, one step further? And what would it mean to create a design practice uh, with our different backgrounds and uh, what would that look like? And that was in 2017. And now five years later, we just celebrated our five year anniversary last week, a couple of weeks ago. And to celebrate, we actually made a little video to kind of celebrate all the work that we've done over the past. So we're gonna play this really short clip of some of our work that we've done. I think, I think five years is a lot to condense in one minute. So that was a selection and I hope it wasn't too overwhelming, but don't worry. We're gonna take you through some of these projects and uh, some other ones that were not in the video. And I think what we wanted to do is try to think of ourselves from different angles and different perspectives and how we tackle different type of projects and the circumstances around uh, these projects. Um, at the end of the day, we are a small uh, business based in Brooklyn and we collaborate with different uh, institutions. One way that we often collaborate uh, with projects is to think of ourselves as visual strategists. And that is usually in projects that are more uh, commonly dubbed as visual identities or branding exercises. Last year, uh, the Webby's Award uh, came to us with a new project, and it was called the uh, Purpose Award. And we collaborated with them to craft a name, a communication strategy, and a visual identity for their new brand. Part of what we do with these sort of exercises where we're trying to enter a new collaboration with a client is do a strategy phase. And that is a, a framework and context that allows us to think together with our client, to look at the landscape and uh, context that affect our project and shape the way it needs to be. And that usually means that we might uh, uh, suggest new names for the institution. We might look at competitive landscape 
or also create our own engaging uh, interactive exercises where we help them uh, verbalize what they're trying to do. And that is not all, only important for us as designers to really understand the issues at hand, but sometimes it's also important for the client and the different stakeholders from the client side to also be involved in the process. Uh, for, the, uh, for the Purpose Driven Award, we eventually uh, uh, decided that their mission is also about amplifying the voices of different institutions that do purpose-driven work and recognize the breadth and purpose mission-driven work that's done by uh, companies uh, in the US, around the world, online and offline. So eventually we uh, settled on the name Anthem, Anthem Awards, uh, as a name to represent this mission of this institution. Uh, and the idea is that their role as a platform is really to amplify the voices of the individual doing uh, purpose-driven uh, work. So eventually we were inspired by the megaphone, if you will, or the bullhorn shape to create a mark that uh, emphasizes the A as anthem, but also has some directionality in it and an idea of a voice that's being uh, projected and uh, given uh, some uh, power into the world. So that was the logo that we proposed to them and we worked uh, to create a, a very strong mark that can also operate as a system. So it can be an icon that they can used to add a signature to different work, but also uh, a way, a mark that can uh, signify different type of works and different touch points with the, um, with the audience. But like any brand, it doesn't uh, end with the mark. It's only just the beginning. And we wanted to create a visual world that takes this idea of triangles, of communities, of things coming together to, big, to uh, build a, a bigger uh, sum of things throughout this motif that repeats and plays out itself in different ways every time. And being the, um, a lot of communication today is really uh, uh, focused on digital, on social media. So the focus on creating an identity that can uh, uh, reinvent itself and be exciting every time is really important. Uh, so while we also think of uh, traditional uh, applications like printed media and stationery, if people still use these things, the focus was also on a digital application on social media. And it's really actually uh, exciting to see how this identity comes to life when it starts being populated with people, with their faces, with the actual content that really brings the identity alive. Otherwise, it's just uh, pure shapes uh, on a page. They actually had their inaugural Anthem Awards a couple of weeks ago, and it was really exciting to see uh, the identity succeed in a way that we kind of uh, went be more than we imagined. We hope to create a solid mark and a triangle that can be a unifier between all these types of communication. And it ended up being also a container for all these people, for all these voices, and uh, eventually an application of the direct uh, mission of the brand itself. Um, another project take us uh, from the US to other places in the world. I am originally uh, from Lebanon, so I speak Arabic and, uh, and, and I, I find myself in between different uh, cross uh, points between the US, New York, the Middle East and the Gulf area, where a lot of change has been happening really, really quickly. So it's really exciting to be able to participate in projects uh, in these countries, um, where a lot of the leadership has realized that the dependence on the hydrocarbon economies is short lived. And they're now investing in new type of uh, culture economies which means that uh, they wanna become the region's leaders, uh, leading power by design. And graphic design is necessary tool in this kind of context to uh, visualize and communicate this new positioning of these focused uh, um, uh, strategies, if you will. So oftentimes designers and star architects are called upon uh, with and tasked with all sorts of jobs from creating advertising campaigns to multilingual publications, uh, but most embl emblematic of all is the task of developing visual identities meant to articulate expansions or mergers or new beginnings. Uh, we have been uh, involved in several type of these projects in the past, and we collaborated with several studios and some of them, some of the projects were our direct clients. But one project in particular is interesting to share is Dadu, the Children Museum of Qatar. On this project, we worked with 2x4, a studio based in New York City under the direction of its partner, Michael Rock, to create the visual identity of Dadu. Uh, as a studio with knowledge uh, and expertise in, 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 uh, in uh, the Arabic language, 
uh, we are often tasked and uh, brought in with two by four specifically to be a kind of like cultural specialist and, and the designers on these projects. So uh, we help them craft the name and develop the identity and design the whole project. Dadu in Arabic means uh, the mark that is left in the sand or uh, when, when, when a child is playing and they leave a mark. Uh, in, in Arabic, it's called Alamat al Dadu. And part of our discussion with the client and in the strategy phase, we understood that a children's museum is more than just an art museum. It's actually an educational institution. So we went back to the shape of the letters themselves to look at the historically, the da, the, the letter da in Arabic, um, and, and it's different, uh, if you will, expressions. And uh, what we wanted to create is a mark and identity that realizes the strategy, which is marked by play. The idea that play can become an educational framework to uh, bringing up children and preparing them to the future. So we're inspired by the building blocks uh, of, of building something. And we wanted to create a mark that kind of uh, also uh, realized the idea that Arabic and English flow in, in different directions. So we also wanted to create a mark that is expressive, that is playful, that is fun for kids to play with, but has an inherent uh, system behind it. Eventually, the logo that we created solved a lot of these problems in a simple mark. So here we see we position the two letters da and do of Arabic with the vocalization marks inside of them as well as the Latin characters, D-A and D-U. So the reading, the opposite reading direction is now resolved. From top to bottom, the mark reads in both languages, has a playful feel to it, and uh, communicates the sense of the uh, mission of the museum itself. Like any identity, to me, it's built like an onion layer with ingredients that make up the different brand. Typography plays an essential role. So we brought in a favorite Arabic that I designed with Khazak Apelian, and we customized some of the diacritic dots to connect them more to the Latin and create a unique voice that can be complemented with graphic shapes inspired by the logo that are actually embedded in the font itself. So it becomes a tool for the museum and for the designers that are to take on this identity and run with it to immediately access these shapes and create graphic uh, uh, material just by typing some of the letters inside the font. Um, obviously colors also play a role in this identity and we kind of envisioned uh, some sort of, if you will, Joseph Albert's relationship of unexpected colors coming together to always keep it fresh and exciting. So when you mix all these kind of visual ingredients together, the shapes, the typography, the color, and they're all guided by the mission of the museum, the marks of play and that graphic system, the, the result is a very uh, uh, versatile system, but it's always has a, a central uh, driving focus in its essence. And that, what, uh, in my opinion, what keeps identities kind of uh, effective in communicating uh, the singular vision of the museum and the versatility and the power it brings. Yes, thank you. So Another way that Marcos Key exists in the world is as editorial collaborators. And we really think of all of our clients as collaborators. I think, you know, people come to us as experts in graphic design and that person can, or our clients are the experts in their field versus that's a cultural institution. It's about art, it's about exhibition, it's about a super specific uh, cultural magazine. And so there's always these spaces for learning. There's always these spaces for research. There's always these spaces for kind of play. So. One of the projects that I want to start with was the Tenth Magazine, which was founded by these gentlemen here, um, Andre Banks on the right, Cal Banks on the left, and um, Kari Sept in the middle, who are who is the editor in chief of the Tenth Magazine. And the Tenth Magazine is a Black queer fashion lifestyle magazine that was founded in uh, what was it founded? Twenty fourteen. And I've been working with them and we've been working with them on the magazine basically since issue two as art directors and designers. And I guess the novel thing about the Tenth Magazine is that this whole purpose is to show that the Black queer community is not a monolith. I remember when I first got the Tenth Magazine in the mail, I was literally shaking and crying because I had never seen anything like this printed before. I had never seen myself in kind of these types of pages. So of course I emailed them, this was years ago, to work and collaborate and it worked out. So this is issue four, which is about technology and really thinking about the intersections of the Black queer person, the Black queer modern person dealing with social media, dealing with the computer, dealing with internet culture. And so as you can see, like a lot of the 
kind of design and art direction aesthetic is borrowing from you know UX UI interfaces kind of over the time from kind of the original kind of 90s Mac OS to kind of the sleeker ones that we see here today and how we can think about kind of the digital world in the print space. So obviously, as you see, text boxes and all of these things become columns and call outs for the actual article itself. One of the things I also love about the Tenth Magazine is the fact that so many of the stories and the writers are, of course, Black and queer, but also really touch on issues that I feel are very nuanced that I wasn't even aware of. For example, like this article called Malcolm Gabriel X, which is really talking about the trials and kind of discriminations that Black queer people face in this kind of internet gaming role playing space. I'm not a gamer, so I don't know anything about games, but I thought it was just really amazing that something that is supposed to be used as escape, there was still barriers there. One of the other amazing things about the Tenth Magazine is that we get to work with amazing photographers. So each article, each issue is always punctuated by these images. And so, for example, Harvey Jackson, Marcus French, Camilio, these are all really amazing, talented photographers in our communities that we get to highlight. And of course, there's fashion really working with you know, for example, Hood by Air, that was a big designer a few years ago, um, featuring his work in the magazine as well. Uh, this issue is the fifth issue that was called The Romantics. And one of the nice things about the Tenth Magazine is that each issue that we create, we kind of make it bespoke to the content at hand. There isn't a consistent masthead, there isn't a consistent kind of type or design system. We really allow the content to influence what the work is. So I love this painting by Robert S. Duncanson of this rainbow scene of this Black Renaissance, our Black Romantics um, era painter. It just starts to make you think about the stories of Black queer people in the past and how they can be reinvented for today. And so as we go through this issue, you know, each, each, like I say, each of the kind of nuances of the magazine come to life with what we're talking about the time. And all the stories, again, are really specific, like the story about King Ra Sumaba, who is this person who thinks that they are a pharaoh, an Egyptian, reincarnated and kind of live their life in this over the top kind of garments and costumes when they, you know, exist in the world. Or well, I love this story with Micheline Michelle, um, who's a famous kind of trans model and Beyonce impersonator, and visiting this house in Hudson, New York, where it was kind of known in the 19th century to be used in the 18th, the 19th and 20th century to be used as a house for you know black people who traveled, and now it's a little bit dilapidated. And so, how can we bring our kind of contemporary stories of black, queer, and trans people into this space to you know remember this history? And yeah, so like this other issue with the Tenth Magazine, um, it's called Cali Cod. So thinking about like the show Insecure meeting kind of a West Coast Cape Cod aesthetic kind of merging together in this issue. And one of the things I love about the Tenth Magazine is that it's such a large crew of collectives of creatives who are working all across the country and sometimes the world. And oftentimes we don't really ever see each other. We never really, really get to like actually spend time kind of be celebrating the work that we're doing. So this issue features a lot of the contributors of the magazine over the years. We literally all came into this place in Provincetown and celebrated with one another. And as you can see, these kind of gestures of the beach and the sand and joy come to life. But also, you know, being in these kind of small beach towns on the East Coast often harken back to histories about obviously slaves coming into these, these places and ports on ships and boats. And what are the legacies of that history in these places as we're there celebrating, as we're there kind of reliving these histories that are very brutal. Also, I'd like to call out the artwork here is done by my twin, Derek Key which I thought, and Jared is an amazing artist. They're actually about to have a solo show in New York on Thursday at 1969 Gallery. But the work really emphasizes this kind of contemporary reinterpretation of the enslaved journey across the Atlantic and how do we exist in our identities today? And so again, like how can we mix these kind of very serious stories with these kind of moments of joy, these moments of leisure, these moments of play, and as well as kind of talking about, again, our queer, kind of nautical experiences. Another project that we recently released is, our really designed was Black Futures. 
that was edited by Kimberly Drew and Jenna Wortham. And Black Futures was a labor of love. It was a very like three year long process of pulling together this five over 500 page book that brings together a hundred different artists, writers, photographers, illustrators, all questioning and asking what does it mean to be black and alive today? And what is our future look like? And especially using the cultural contributions and artistic contributions of uh, black people, you know, to be the kind of catalyst and the, I guess like the, the gateway into this conversation. The book is really inspired a lot by how Kimberly and Jenna met. They met on Instagram, on the internet. And we were thinking a lot about how this book is really, you know, aware of its time and using kind of this rhizomatic structure of how you can move around the book and navigate it as if, you know, you have a browser open with multiple tabs and you click on a link and it leads you someplace else. And so as you see in the design, there's these call outs of related entries that kind of link similar stories together. There's also the kind of tagging system on the right side that has the author's name, as well as this color coding system that points at to things that are social media in yellow or things that are kind of like cookbooks and recipes in green and kind of poetry and artistic interpretations in black. Um, the Black Futures project is like one of these projects that I just feel so honored and blessed to have been a part of. And I love this cover because really thinking about Black as this color of encompassing, you know, all the colors and all these different experiences and allowing this Black Futures metallic type to really show you the range of these colors. Because again, like the Black community is not a monolith. The Black experience is not a monolith and the Black visual uh, voice is not a monolith, but how you can really show the richness and the depth of that in this one container. Yeah, I mean, we love designing books, and I think there's something that I cannot get over, which is the physicality of a finished object that you can hold uh, in your hand, which a lot of the projects that we work on, whether identities or social media or online-based projects, don't offer that luxury, if you will. Um, so I also work on a lot of books with um, different institutions, like the one here with the Sharjah Architectural Triennial, where we designed uh, two publications, one in English and one in Arabic. And I think when working in a multilingual, multi-script typographic context, it brings in its own set of challenges and uh, design problems to solve and to kind of realize. And it's actually a, sort of a fun project to do because Arabic goes from right to left, as I mentioned, and English goes from left to right. So how does that affect a book that flows linearly? And even if a designer has the whole map of the book in their head, the reader at the end of the day is gonna open it from one end or the other. So in each project we've done, it allowed us to kind of re-explore uh, these uh, separate different ways of organizing the information of the book and consider the flow of reading. How do you do the translation or the image plates or how do you nest one language within the other and which language is more important, which comes first, what language was the content originally written on? These are all type of like nuanced questions that help us make decision and structure this book. In this case uh, of these books that I'm showing here, the Charge Architectural Triennial, what, the easiest solution is sometimes when budget permits and the publisher uh, uh, decides so, is to publish the same thing in two entire different languages. So in this case, it's one design that's mirrored uh, literally between the English book and the Arabic book. And that allows us to create these double uh, publications that act as uh, complementary one to the other. But even in those cases, I mean, we, we live in such a globalized age that uh, it's hard to see a book that's 100% truly in Arabic or in one language. There's always some references to hyperlinks that needs to be typeset in, in, in a different alphabet. So this offers us a lot of like questions, like how do you kind of nest these things in a way that still makes sense? How do you organize this information? What kind of fonts do you use? Which brings me uh, to a whole different type of chapter that um, we are also um, uh, we're, um, engaging in. And that is thinking of ourselves as type designers. So, I mean, typographer or graphic designer is somebody who, you, who designs using letters and fonts. And type designers are people who actually draw the fonts. And that is particularly an area that I'm extremely excited about and interested in. And I devote a lot of my time and my collaboration in developing and drawing contemporary Arabic fonts. Uh, I mean, Arabic as a language has had the most rich history in terms of calligraphic uh, practices, but unfortunately has always been as an afterthought 
when it comes to technology and how do you adapt a connected script to keyboards that are designed inherently to, for detached characters. Um, so there's a lot of room of innovation to cover, which is why every project I'm involved in uh, offers, again, an uh, opportunity for invention. This is, for example, some tests with variable fonts on an Arabic font called Kufam that instead of just uh, addressing the weight, uh, also addressing an elongation that happens in some of the Arabic characters. And the result is this font Kufam uh, that I designed with Artur Shmal, a type designer in Amsterdam, and a part of a project that, by the Khat Foundation in 2010. I mean, the, the, the jump between the history of calligraphy and the future of digital design uh, is not so big a leap. And that's why there's still a lot of uh, look back into history and try to um, see this, the solution that uh, scri scribes have come up with in designing complex layouts to adapt them to today. Which opens up another interesting window, which is uh, some people call it typographic matchmaking. And it's also a kind of a, interesting quest question. How do we design uh, the um, Arabic version of an existing Latin design? And what does that mean in terms of the political ramification of, of colonial histories or the respect of the origin of the own script? So I think to my mind, I think uh, as long as a designer who is native to the language and has a decision maker making is present on the table, it's really um, uh, important to yield results that are uh, uh, aware of the history of the script and the convention that accompany the Arabic specifically. So I showed you graphic Arabic, and this is Brando Arabic, both designed with the help of Khajak Affilion that I collaborate with on a lot of Arabic type design. Graphic was published by Commercial Type and uh, Brando was published by Bold Monday. And recently Khajak and I collaborated again uh, with IBM to create the Arabic version of their typeface, which was designed by Mike Abing. Um, and the Latin typeface is uh, kind of a slab serif that combines uh, the uh, qualities of something that's man-made, but also has a human touch in it. And type design can also be a very uh, kind of like focused experience where it's all about the black and white shapes of the letters and the relationship between each other and the functionality of that font when it's done. Particularly, for example, a small detail in uh, a lot of the uh, counters in IBM have a flat side on the inside and around a curve on the outside. So that is also translated to the Arabic, but horizontally as letter connects on the baseline. So we have to draw the characters in a very specific way so they connect seamlessly while having a smooth curve uh, at the bottom and flat on the inside between the letters. There's a lot of consideration that go and uh, some typefaces take months and months, if not years to produce. And it can be a hermetic uh, or a meditational practice sometimes. But to me as a designer, it allows me to take a, off the hat of the creative director or a business partner running the studio and sometimes the luxury to spend time um, focusing on relationship between letters that become systems uh, for shaping language and allows you to bring a lot of like uh, unearthed history and bring it back to modern uh, ways. And most importantly to me, it allows me to create tools that I can then use in my project as well, whether it's uh, identities, or, uh, or, 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 or book design. The, the last one I'll mention is Lyon Arabic, also designed with Khazak Apelian for commercial type, where we designed a slanted option uh, for the Arabic to complement the italic of the Latin. And instead of just taking a design and slanted it as is, we looked back at history where we found uh, practices where a scribe would combine different types of Arabics within one page to indicate different uh, hierarchies of information. So that allows us also to create something that is exciting, that is relatively new for Arabic typography and allow graphic designers to use these ways of uh, slanted Arabic for emphasis within the line, uh, similarly to how italic is used for Latin. All these exploration with Arabic sometimes take a different expression and something a little bit more graphic. And uh, we do a lot of Arabic lettering. And that is uh, also an exciting uh, um, type of work that we do. What you're looking at is some lettering that we did for Nike for the FIFA campaign for the Saudi football national team. So we came in as uh, collaborators with the art directors to suggest typographic solution that they can use within their campaign. Nike was creating these campaigns for every country that was participating in the football uh, season. 
Um, and to us to see the funds that we created and the type of graphic choices and the letters that we drew being used on such a level was really exciting and a way to kind of recombine uh, Arabic as a language with something that's very energetic and very modern and very contemporary in a way that excites the audience and keep, uh, keep um, the graphic design language uh, in Arabic relevant and alive. Some projects that we do sometimes tend to be a formal exercise on translating uh, marks into Arabic. This is a logo for commercial type, for Bloomberg, as well as other uh, uh, international businesses that wanna expand in different markets in the Middle East, where uh, there are laws that would require them to have the sign on the shop uh, in the native language. It's also a political economic uh, decision, but it, it opens up a window for creativity and imagining the expression, the typographic expression of these international brands uh, within local uh, languages and dialects. Which Great. brings us to the chapter as artists. Yes, and so of course, as you can see, like we are, we do a lot of different types of projects. We have a lot of different passions for the work that we do. But for myself, I'm also a visual artist. And I think as a person that uses graphic design as a tool to amplify other people's stories, other people's voices, I love painting and drawing and photography as a way to solidify my own stories and be able to share space for the work and the things I care about. So this kind of brings us back to the start of the lecture of thinking about these four questions that I was asking myself and figuring out ways that these for identities, blackness and family and queerness and southernness, how do they overlap and how can they come to life in a visual form? This is a photography series I did in 2016 that's called Tensions and Fragmentations, which was the first time that I was really performing these kind of um, disparate siloed identities that overlap. So this one was the green one for southernness, the violet one for queerness, the black one in this gesture for blackness and red for family thinking about bloodline and ancestry and lineage. And that kind of at that time, the post Orlando nightclub shooting happened in 2016. I don't know if you remember this, but there was a nightclub in Florida. It was um, at that point in 2016, the worst mass shooting that we had in America. It was a queer nightclub filled with people of color. I remember that happening and really questioning like what spaces do queer people of color claim as safe? Where can we go to be with one another and actually feel uh, together, united and healed? And I started the series of paintings called Man in the Violet Suit, which really was thinking about this queer body, this figure, um, contorting and fitting into these spaces and the different kinds of oppressions and pressures that he might experience. But also this idea of agency and this figure looking at you in the eye and always having this black power fist, and this open hand of uh, collaboration. The work, all of this work is really personal. It's all inspired by my own personal narratives of where I'm from in my family. For example, the Polka dots that you see are inspired by my grandmother's name. Her name, her nickname was Polka Dot. And the kind of triangle of patterns that you see are the rectangular patterns that you see. This kind of plaid gesture is inspired by my dad wearing his kind of construction worker, labor work uniform to work and thinking about how in my body, the kind of matriarch and patriarch comes together into me. And then thinking about, again, this figure kind of being released from the void, exploring the world, um, exploring landscapes, and also exploring interior spaces. This has worked over several years. Um, and I think it's been really exciting to kind of push the boundaries of these narratives and thinking about spaces where the man in the body suit is alone and in private and uh, undressed, or thinking about, you know, these, the relationships between family members. So for example, this is a painting of my twin and myself, or thinking about my biological family versus my chosen family. And so I painted a lot of paintings of my dad on the left, again, in his kind of uniform, painted in the red color for family, the green color for southernness, his dad, Frankie, kind of in the same fashion. Similarly, I painted my mother on the left, and then my grandmother, Polka Dot, on the right. And then thinking about, okay, 
what are the stories of my biological family, but then moving to New York City, establishing my own relationships. I have established my own family here and my chosen family where, you know, friends become siblings and um, mentors become paternal figures and thinking about on the right, how all of these kind of this gesture becomes a gesture of support, a gesture of love. Um, I'm represented by a couple of galleries. This is in the Steve Turner Gallery in LA from a recent solo show I had last year. Um, the show is entitled Lean on Me. And again, you are seeing, again, my queer chosen family uh, together in this park setting, reclaiming rest, reclaiming love, and reclaiming this idea of support. I have been asked and been fortunate to be asked to do a few collaborations inspired by my painting. So the painting objects are all acrylic paint on panel, the earlier works were on paper, but a lot of my process is also doing these digital illustrations. This was a mural that was done in Atlanta where I have a lot of family for the American portrait series for PBS. And I love this quote, I am not invisible by Leslie that really Again, it's thinking about resiliency and being seen and being shown. Um, I've also been inspired by, like, or been asked by the New York Times to do illustrations for various articles in which, like, these digital illustrations kind of take their own kind of life form and kind of have their own kind of gestures and codes. But it's really nice to be working with contemporary writers and contemporary authors and these large platforms to really showcase this work. This is one that I did most recently that was of the Will Smith family uh, that is thinking about how Hollywood's first family of putting it out there and them sharing all of their stories through life. And I was asked to do this illustration of them that was also printed on the cover of the Art and Leisure section, which was just such an amazing honor to be able to, you know, have that happen. And I think the last category is thinking about more close key as community organizers. I think a lot of our work obviously exists in the studio. A lot of our work obviously exists of us working by ourselves in all these various different spaces or with our team. But I think, again, all of our work is so driven by elevating and amplifying people that look like us and share our experiences. And so, for example, um, I founded Codify Art with a few of my Brown and RISD classmates in 2013, we moved to New York City, and Codify Arts mission is, well, we're a Brooklyn-based artist collective, a multidisciplinary artist, and our mission is to create, curate, and produce work by artists of color, particularly women, queer, and trans artists of color. And over the years, we have done networking events, we've done open mic nights, we've done gallery shows, and this was actually from one of the earliest networking events that we did, and actually just being able to bring the community together and actually know who the queer people are, who the queer artists are, and actually being able to mingle and network and build collaborations. Um, this is a picture from Spring Break Art Fair with my early work here next to Martin Gutierrez, who's this amazing, um, photographer, model, actress. I mean, she's just this amazing uh, artist whose work was actually recently in the Venice Biennale two years ago. Um, and it's just, and it has work at the Whitney Museum. It's just so amazing. Uh, this is another show that we did that was all kind of Korean diasporic artists curated by Sung, Lee, Sung Kit Lee, who is one of our um, co-founders as well. And it's just nice, like, you know, this is all pre-COVID, of course, and I hope we can get back there soon. But to have these moments of celebration and actually be able to mingle together and build community is, you know, one of our biggest, you know, joys as a collective. And lastly, this was a workshop that we did at the Whitney Museum where we were asked to come into their collection and pull a works that we could talk about in terms of the things of labor and love. And uh, we like did like a writing workshop, and a zine workshop with uh, the 75 people that were there. And yeah, I mean, it's uh, been really amazing. So the next steps for us are we're working on a book project currently and trying to again, pull together these different stories and people that we've worked with. Um, I mean, similarly, I'm originally from Lebanon. I've been in New York for like 10 years. And I think what we try to do is rebuild families here and communities around us. Um, and one way to do it is to start these like group of people who come together to do things. So with the help of Kamal Kamal, uh, Joel, uh, Ranim, and Lynn Amhaz, we started a collective that we called 101. 
And its goal is to really showcase uh, the voices of Arab Americans and to show that voice in uh, the community and uh, to try to see what that future for these communities might look like. To kind of uh, appreciate the change and uh, diversity that exists within, within us and to celebrate that. So that also takes the shape of a blog and an Instagram account and a lot of um, in-person activity. But unfortunately, with COVID, that also has been halted a little bit. But we have been uh, we've done um, a lettering workshop, uh, embroidery workshops, and art galleries slash uh, parties, where we also try to look around us, see people that are doing exciting work, and then invite us to come uh, do some physical activity together. I think this brings us almost to the last slide. This is from uh, a party that we did a couple of years ago where we invited, uh, again, artists, performers, uh, as well as photographers, singers, rappers, uh, had art on the wall and party in between and kind of created a space that we parked for ourselves to kind of um, see each other and see who else share these background stories with us. Um, and I think for all these reasons uh, is why we started our studio Marcus Key as a practice to allow us to put on these different hats, try on these different things and express ourselves uh, while working with clients or collaborators or community members that uh, we are excited about. Um, and I mean, this is the end of our journey here with you. So thank you so much for listening in and uh, giving us the time to share with you our work and our uh, stories. Yes, thank you. So I, mean, I think we have a few minutes for questions. So if you want to put questions in the chat or if you want to raise your hand or if you want to just, I don't know, call out <laughs> in the chat, we would you know, love to answer you know, any questions that might, you might have. Or maybe there's some questions in the chat already. Uh, you guys, I'll just jump in. I'm part of the Walker Arts team. And thank you so much. It has been eye-opening, I have to say. So, I mean, especially towards like the how the foundations of uh, the technology were laid and how you are now trying to kind of uh, tackle that is really inspiring in terms of, you know, right to left, left to right, right? and also connected uh, letters and everything. But I would like to take a moment to take a step back. And you did have a slide um, mentioning visual strategy. And strategy is a word that I use quite often. And I am aware of its military con you know, connotations, right? Like strategy. Yeah. I think we all uh, learn strategy from military. So when you say visual strategy, what do you actually mean? What are the steps you take? Yeah, so normally when we start any project with a client, I mean, our process, our process for any project normally happens in three phases. The first phase is literally a strategy phase in which there's like a survey, there's a questionnaire, we have lots of listening and calls and research meetings. There's normally um, hands-on workshops in which we investigate with stakeholders and we investigate with, um, you know, whoever are making decisions that, at, at the time for that client. We really ask them questions. We have a mood boarding exercise. We have a name, naming exercise. We have done naming workshops. We just recently did one for a new, um, a new uh, kind of editorial platform. Uh, which you know just brought in all of these different amazing journalists and editors and writers and kind of really thinking about how we can think about the name and positioning of you know what that client was offering and then for us we kind of go back into our den and do more research we kind of um, what do you like summarize or even add to the story that the client is trying to tell so sometimes they may not have a mission they may not have a clear philosophy. They may not know like their tone and voice of how they should be communicating. Sometimes it's a startup that needs verbalizing exactly what it stands for. Like they know how to manufacture whatever they're doing, but they need somebody to help them craft that language. language yeah. 
And uh, it really, the strategy is really a space for everybody to be part of the process, be onboarded and uh, make decisions together before it becomes more of a design, pure design exercise. Exactly. And then again, like, so the second phase will be design, but really by the end of the strategy phase, there's like a few presentations that we've done with them. Everybody's really on the same page about what we want for the project. Everyone's using the same language. Everyone has the same visual references. Everyone, you know, we're all aligned. So, you know, that kind of allows us to kind of push to the design work even more because, you know, we've gotten the client used to certain things that we're kind of trying to get them to agree to later <laughs> that they don't realize. So it is like war. I mean, like, <laughs> it, it, it is like we try to set up. These are like put these images and references in that we really want to push oh, and explore yeah. that might feel. I prefer to call it diplomacy. Diplomacy. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And I think sometimes you need to really push with references to get a reaction, right? Like that's exactly. like a therapy session. Yeah, a big no might be illuminating as much as a big yes. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Totally. I mean, um, I have been on the both sides of the table, so to say. So I have been working in it as a designer and then commissioning designers. And I do know the tensions around that, but I, my sense from your presentation was like, you're almost um, marching on a pedagogical journey to make them better clients. Hmm. Would you like to re reflect on I that? Mean, I mean, when I was in undergrad, the uh, top teacher would tell us, your role as a designer is to educate the client. And I always sat, sat, sat with me a little bit weird because educating somebody is a, such a loaded term. Um, I think, I mean, we have certain sensibilities because of who we are and the client is expert at what they do. Uh, and I think the role is for both of us to learn from each other in a way and uh, to us as well be opening to getting to uh, learn from them and also, yeah, maybe educate each other. Yeah, and I mean, and also, like, the reality is that, you know, a lot of our clients, you know, don't live in a visual world. Like, they don't use visual words. They don't use the kind of design language that we're used to like, yeah, like seeing. Yeah, like, their design extent is Pinterest boards. Exactly. So we use that to kind of access, access where they're thinking and to create bridges into where we would like to take them. But also, we have to sometimes educate them and give them that language throughout this process, too. And that's why the strategy phase and the, the really getting that kind of all together is important. Yeah, yeah, I agree. As a client and a creative, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? If you don't want to shout it out, you can also just type it in the chat if you have a, anything you would like to ask us. I think we have a couple of, few more minutes for one or two more questions. I'll toss one out. Hi, my name is Jamie in New York. And I just wanted to thank you for your talk and for your terrific work. And my question may be an obvious one, but here we are on Women's History Day. And so I'm just curious about having your experiences and the topics and important issues that, of equity that you're taking a look at with your work. I'm curious about your learnings or your successes that you've come upon as you've been in countries like Saudi Arabia. And I don't ask that question foolishly because I know that there are big changes and good changes happening in Saudi Arabia in particular, but I'm just curious how you have addressed the issues around women and women's equity in your work in, especially in those, uh, well, here and there, I guess. I mean, I, and it's that's 8th a... of March. Sorry. <laughs> I think that's a really, really uh, great question. And thank you for asking that. I think part of the reason we started the studio is to have agency on what projects we take on, what kind of clients we collaborate uh, on, what we say yes or no. And I think I am someone who is uh, optimistic by nature and decides to see the, ha the, side, the, the side is half full of the glass. And like you said, there are a lot of exciting changes happening in all different places in the Middle East. And uh, we have said no to projects and we have really embarked on exciting projects that push the envelope specifically. And it actually makes us excited. 
we didn't show this project, but it's on our website. We created uh, an exhibition with the Northwestern University in Qatar called Media Revolutions in the Middle East. And it surveys all types of, uh, of uh, media technology that was introduced from the, to the Middle East, usually uh, as Western technology and how that helped reshape uh, and create sometimes social upheaval. And the, the ex exhibition is so interesting because it traces historically local tradition like uh, spoken poetry or oral theater in, in uh, the public space within a square of a small city to all the way to radio, newspaper, TV, until social media today, Twitter, and how that played a role in the Arab Spring and the emancipation of, of oppressed people and uh, more visibility for minorities in the Middle East and women. So I guess in the short, that's how, that's how we deal with these issues. We choose to partner with projects that our values align with us and uh, we choose to work with clients that understand uh, what we are excited about and uh, where we align all this vision. And we try to do our best to um, not take what we know as our assumption as truth, but try to also be inquisitive and uh, represent in the best way possible. Great, thank you. Thank you. Maybe we have time for one more question. Do you actually go to the Middle East for your Middle Eastern clients and visit with them? Um, yeah. And engage with them um, or do it by Zoom meetings or um, if you could I mean, talk about how you, in, you know, engage with people at such a long distance. We use, I used to travel a lot more before COVID. COVID mm -hmm. definitely forced everybody to retreat to their Zoom windows. And we also did that. And I think also clients realized that maybe the work can be done over Zoom. But I'm glad to now hear and to see that things are reopening again. I'm actually traveling to Cairo in two weeks for a lecture and a workshop. Uh, and I'm excited to be part of uh, that space. I'm from Lebanon, which is uh, like the Levantine area of the right. Middle East, which is right. around Syria and Jordan. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the Middle East is such a huge uh, geographic uh, place. Yes, we all speak Arabic, but every country has a different dialect on Arabic. And the further you get from where you are, the more different the dialect is. So I can understand 100% of Syrian, but maybe 50% of Kuwaiti Arabic, um, mm -hmm. uh, and even less of Moroccan, uh, maybe 20% of Moroccan. But what links us together is actually the script and the way it's connected. So... To me, these are always exciting, uh, exciting um, visits because it allows me to experience a pan-Arab identity that I am part of, uh, but it also allows me to see how is it different from mine and how is it uh, close to who I am as a person who comes from Lebanon, from Beirut, from a cosmopolitan background, who went to a French school, who speaks four languages and who was colonized by the French. Mm -hmm. So that's my type of history. And they have a whole specific histories, um, people from the Emirates or from Egypt. And um, it's, it's, uh, it's always been amazing. It's really exciting. The clients that we have had the chance to work with have been positive, supportive, and uh, believed in us. And uh, I'm always love to do more of these projects and we'll hope to travel <laughs> more and come back. Yeah, I mean, obviously I'm not from the Middle East, I'm from <laughs> Alabama, but- We, we did able, notice that. <laughs> <laughs> but being able to travel to Qatar, I mean, like exhibition is pretty hard to do on Zoom. So being able to travel to Qatar and like, again, you know, my assumptions and my learning the language and my learning the culture and being able to translate this through graphic design work and use graphic design to be this cultural exchange tool for some way. It's like for me, at least as a designer and being there and learning and yes, yeah, it's just been amazing. I can't wait to go back. I mean, it's been a couple of years because of COVID, but I mean, we were, we were traveling <laughs> to Qatar a lot for a second. Mm. Well, thank you very much. Your, you. your work yeah. is really fantastic. Thank you for sharing it with us. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. There's a question in writing. Did anyone raise their hand? <laughs> there is a uh, question I, in, the, in the chat. Yeah. yeah. Can I read it? Uh, what or who is a collaborator you're hoping to partner with in the near future as either an expansion of the hats you wear in your closet, as it were, or just a client that would be a dream? Uh, dream client. I mean, I have a list. 
<laughs> What's on my list? I mean, I, I don't know if it's dream clients, but something that bugs me is the typography on the ticker of this news uh, agency like CNN, where they just condense the typography because the headline is longer. So we need to introduce them to variable font technology. Another project that I would want to do is connect with the Arab American Museum in Detroit and help them recraft their identity because they definitely need it. So if you are listening, call me. <laughs> and a third hat that I would want to put, I've been recently very excited about trying to bring design to more physical objects. And I've been experimenting with Arabic typography on blankets and um, uh, household items that can be elevated by design and the expression of design on these uh, items. So maybe that's a hat I need to work on a little bit more if I have time. <laughs> I love it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I guess that's it. Yes. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Emmett. I think Emmett's gonna say some words. Yeah, I just wanted to thank you guys. That was really, really fascinating. Um, and I wanna thank the audience for coming out tonight and asking great questions. Uh, and this talk will be archived on the Walker's YouTube channel. So you'll be able to watch it again and recommend it to your friends. Um, so yeah, thank you so much, John and Yael. That was amazing. Thank you thank for having you for us. Thank you for having us. Yeah.